Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Pastor Travis, Dr. Priscilla here, and we want to say thank you so much for joining us right here yes. at City Church Live. It is our pleasure to have you guys joining us. and We are just so thrilled to be in God's house today. Right? Amen. Amen. Welcome. You are in the right place. So today, the rhetorical question, is there anything that's too hard for God? Well, that's going to come from today's story. And today, Dr. Foster is going to wrap up the series on Who's Your Daddy? It's the study on life, leadership, and the legacy of our father Abraham. So we're going to see the powerful parallels between Abraham and Isaac and God the Father and God the Son. So our faith is going to be built today as we explore the critical moments that frame our faith. And yeah. so therefore, you don't want to miss it. Absolutely. It is going to be amazing to wrap this up. Yeah, this, this is up. a great story yes. in the scriptures yeah. today. And I am just so excited that we get to look at that more in depth today. Yeah. This is one that is always life giving. And there is special stuff for us today as we open up the word of God. Amen. Yes. Amen. So we're just so thrilled that you guys decided to join us here. And man, I'll be honest, I am just thrilled that you're here, but I also know that your friends and your family members, they should be here too. Because as we come to the scriptures with an open heart, mm -hmm. God does something miraculous, right? Yes, he does. So why don't you do us a favor really quickly and be a part of our digital evangelism and just click the like button, click that share button as well so that they can come into contact with this message yes. today. Yes. And while you're at it, go ahead and click the subscribe and notification button as well on YouTube so that you never miss when we're going live yes. for a service. Definitely. Amen. Amen. But I am just so thrilled to be here and I know that we're about to start service in a couple seconds. So grab your Bibles, a notebook, a coffee if you need it, and let's get ready to go into God's house. We'll be back with you guys in a little bit. Enjoy the service. Morning, City Church. Can we give God a hand clap of praise this morning? Can we just look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Are you ready to worship?
this morning? I said, do anybody need strength this morning? We rest on your promises, Jesus. Say, strength will rise, say. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. your neighbor is going through this morning but can we just be strength for our neighbor this morning can we just open our mouths and pray for our neighbors this morning don't even focus on your circumstances but let's just focus on our neighbors you don't know you don't need to know the problems or the situations just let's just open our mouths and pray in this moment Lord we need you Lord we thank Oh, oh. Come on, can we just pray? For 10 more seconds, can we just pray? Oh, oh, oh. You are the everlasting God. just give him a praise right now Lord we bless you. Lord we love you. there's nobody like you Jesus in his word he said he'll be a strong tower Say, our God. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are, you are the everlasting God. The Do not fail. 
frequency in our own physical bodies. If we're tired and weak, it is impossible for us to lift our hands. But if we know who the one that we serve, they can hold up our arms in the times of need. Come on, can we just raise up holy hands? Come on, and say, say you are. And welcome to our final installment in our series titled, Who's Your Daddy? An in-depth study on the life, the leadership, and the legacy of Father Abraham. We pick up scripture today in Genesis chapter 18 and verse number one. It says, the Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. One day, Abraham was sitting at the entrance of the tent during the hottest part of the day. He looked up and noticed three men standing there nearby. When he saw them, he ran to meet them and welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. I want you to see that Abraham was able to recognize from a distance that God was showing up in his circumstance. Oh, listen, we're we're gonna be a lot further down the road if we can recognize when God is showing up in our circumstances. Sometimes we're like the disciples that were on the Sea of Galilee. They saw Jesus, but they thought Jesus was a ghost. It wasn't until Jesus spoke that they recognized him and then asked him to come on board. You see, the sooner we recognize that God is showing up in our circumstance, the more victory we're gonna walk in, the more peace we're gonna walk in, the more joy we're gonna walk in. Abraham looked from a distance and recognized that God was showing up in his circumstance. Verse number four, Abraham said to the men, Rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your journey. All right, they said, do as you've said. As I've read through and studied this passage, I've often thought that, you know, the Lord didn't need to have his feet washed. The Lord didn't need the meat. It's not like he showed up hungry. But the Lord was allowing this 
for Abraham's sake. It's, it's tantamount to your little daughter or granddaughter inviting you to a tea party. Come on, somebody. I have never been to a tea party where I actually got tea. Huh? You attend the tea party for the person that's putting on the party. So the Lord was attending this party for Abraham. And so, verse number six, Abraham ran back to the tent and said, Sarah, hurry, get three large measures of your best flowers, knead it into dough, and bake some bread. Then Abraham ran out to the field and chose a tender calf and gave it to a servant to quickly prepare it. When the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk and roasted meat, and he served it to the men. As they ate, Abraham waited with them in the shades of the trees. Verse 9, where's Sarah, your wife? The visitors asked. At this point in the narrative, now we know this is the Lord, but at this point in the narrative, the, uh, Moses, who is writing this, is not yet revealed that it's the Lord, but you're going to see that change right here. Where is your wife, Sarah? The visitors asked. Inside the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return about this time next year. And your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening to the conversation on the inside of the tent. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of y'all like to eavesdrop every now and then? Huh? She was eavesdropping. Do you know where eavesdropping comes from? It, it comes from back in the day when people used to keep their windows open. The eave of the roof sticks out like this and uh, the space between where the water falls and the house is called the eaves drop and so people used to walk up to your house believe it or not like if you were in the city where they would they would get in between the eaves drop and they would listen to what you're saying to your husband well Sarah was eavesdropping on the conversation with the Lord. Verse number 11, Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time. And Sarah was long past the age of ch having children. So she laughed silently to herself. How could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure? Especially when my master, my husband is so old. You gotta love that. Then the Lord said to Abraham, so see, the narrative switched. Now we know this is the Lord. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I'm gonna say that again for somebody that didn't quite get it. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I don't know what obstacle you're up against, but my question to you is, is there anything that is too hard for the Lord? Is cancer too hard for the Lord? Is finance problems too hard for the Lord? Is your health too hard for the Lord? Is your work problems too hard for the Lord? Are your children's problems too hard for the Lord? Nothing is too hard for my God. When the Lord asked this rhetorical question, it was not a question to be answered. It was a rhetorical question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Verse 15, Sarah was afraid, so she denied it that she laughed. She said, I didn't laugh, but the Lord said, no, you did laugh. I think that's funny. The Lord called her out on her stuff. I just think that's great. You know, sometimes when God calls us out on our stuff, it's because he has good things for us. He didn't call her out to embarrass her. He didn't call her out to heap loads of guilt upon her that she could not in and of herself process. He called her out because he had a blessing for her. Don't resist the moments when the Holy Spirit calls you out 
When he calls you out, recognize that God has a blessing for you. He's trying to get you in a position where you can receive everything that God has for you. You see, Sarah had lost the vision. Time had rendered God's word to her as nothing but a pipe dream. A mere fantasy of a tale that would forever remain in the bitter, hollow chambers of her soul. Hope had been replaced with hopelessness. Optimism had been replaced with skepticism. Faith had been replaced with fret as she laughs at the word of the Lord. But four months later, the nonagenarian began to get sick in the morning. Mm, Can I get a witness? Her staff began to think, well, maybe she's getting ready to die. But before too long, she began to crave camel hump and peanut butter. Have you ever been there, ladies? (laughs) Then before long, she developed a little baby bump. 90-year-old Sarah. With the potential and the promise of God pregnant in her womb. Just as much of a miracle as when the Holy Spirit would overshadow a teenager from the little town of Nazareth and miraculously conceive Yeshua who would make a way. You see, you cannot read the story of this part of Abraham's life separate from the story of Jesus Christ. This is a foreshadowing of everything that Jesus would come and do for us. Genesis chapter 21, verse number one. It says, the Lord kept his word. How many of you know God always keeps his word? The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened just at the time God said it would. And Abraham named his son Isaac, which means laughter. I love that. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. And all who hear about this will laugh with me. You see, the promise began by Sarah laughing and hiding it. But when the promise was fulfilled, everyone was laughing with Sarah. You know why? Because I want you, listen, I want you to get a dream for your life. I want you to receive a promise that God has for you. I want you to receive what God is doing in your life to the point to where when God does what he said he would do, other people will laugh with you, not at you. They'll laugh with you because they will say, look what God has done. Look what God has done. When things seem impossible, remember nothing is him possible. With God, everything is him possible. The book of Hebrews says that Abraham was as good as dead when Isaac was born. Sometimes God will wait until no one else can take the credit. Until no one else can say, look what I did. So that everybody will say, look what the Lord has done. Genesis 22, we pick up scripture there. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, I am here. Now, you may ask, it's a good question. If the all-knowing God, he knows everything. He's completely aware of all of our thoughts, of everything that transpires. If God truly is all-knowing, why did he have to test Abraham? 
Well, the answer to that question is God tested Abraham not for God's benefit, but for Abraham's benefit. But also for Isaac's benefit. So the test was for them, but the story is for 2022. The story is for you right now. His story is his story. And it's coming alive right in front of us today. Take a look at verse number two. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, whom you love so much and go to the land of Moriah. So far, so good, right? Road trip. But the next sentence is even difficult to read. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. This is more than a test. This is a prophetic foreshadowing. You will see all throughout the text in Genesis, God makes the statement, your only son, the one you love. Take your only son, the one you love. Take your only son, the one you love. That phrase would be used to describe a different father offering his only son, the one that he loved on a different mountain as a once and for all sacrifice for everyone. Verse three, the next morning, he got up and left the next day. The next morning, Abraham got up early. Somebody say early. Early. He saddled his donkey, took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for the fire, for the burnt offering, and set out for the place that God had told him about. Notice Abraham did not wait. You know why? Because delayed obedience is still disobedience. When we delay obedience in our life, It is opening a window for the enemy to come in and steal. He left immediately. He left early. You know why? Because if he left a little bit later, Sarah would have found out what he was doing and she would have killed him. He left early in the morning, the Bible says. The writer of Hebrews gives us a little bit more insight, some parathetical commentary, if you will, as to exactly what he was thinking. Because it's difficult for us to process this as a father. To think, okay, did I really just hear God? I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I, would, I would be thinking, man, I just had some bad Arabian ox last night. That's all that was. God, you're not really speaking to me right now. But he left early. Because delayed obedience is disobedience. But this is what Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number nine. It says, Abraham reasoned. So now we get a parenthetical insight into his reason. He reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. The reason that's extra significant is at this point in scripture, no one had ever been resurrected from the dead. And so Abraham is connected to a faith that is a future faith. Real faith is future faith. You perceive what God is going to do in the future. You believe what God is going to do in the future. So Abraham reasoned, even though no one had ever been resurrected from the dead, he reasoned that the same God that miraculously gave me that baby can bring him back again. Even still, this is your son. This is your son. Imagine, would you go? I couldn't. I'm a man of faith. But I don't know that I could go. But our spiritual daddy went to show us the way. To show us the model of trusting God. And more importantly, to introduce us to Jehovah Jireh. You see, 
This is not just about Abraham and Isaac. It's really a prequel to the cross of Jesus Christ. Moses is sure to slow the narrative down just enough for us to feel the anguish of this father. To feel the confusion but yet ultimate trust of Isaac. Verse four, it says, on the third day of the journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. By the way, the place where he was offered, Mount Moriah, that is where the the dome of the rock is in Jerusalem. So on top of that mountain, that little mountain where the dome of the rock is, where the future temple will be built, up on top of that mountain there is, is where we're talking about. The third day, think about that. Three days they traveled. That's a long time to second guess God. I wonder what they were talking about for three days. I wonder what was Abraham talking about that kept him taking one step after the other after the other when he knew what God was about to ask him to do. I think he was talking about All the things that God has done in the past. You see, this is very important. Write it down if you're taking notes. When we are facing a major test, we've got to remember everything that was on the quiz. I want you to think through every quiz. If you're going through a major test right now, I want you to think through every quiz that you've been through. Every time you thought God wasn't gonna come through, but he showed up anyway. Every time you didn't know if you were gonna have enough to make the ends meet, but God provided. Every time you needed a physical touch on your body, I want you to think back to all the quizzes. And when you face a major test, the answer to that test It's found in all the quizzes you've been through. So Abraham is talking to Isaac and he's like, there was this one time where the original 300, my 318 men, we went out and we whooped five kingdoms with the power of God. And he's talking about him being supernaturally called out of Ur of the Chaldees. He's talking about time and again, how God showed up and visited. He told him about how God delivered Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. He was telling him about all the quizzes he'd been through and the faithfulness of God and the faithfulness of God. Listen, don't you dare lose the power of that old testimony in your life. It still has the power to give you answers to get over that next hill that God has for you. Verse five, they get to the place. They're in what we know now as Jerusalem. Verse five says, Abraham speaking to the servants. He says, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will travel a little farther. Watch what he says. We will worship there. And then we. We'll come back. But he left some servants down with the donkeys. Can I just tell you that not everybody is going to climb to the mountain of God with you. There are some people that you have to leave at the foot of the mountain with the donkeys. There are some people that you've got, listen, they're just not going to go where you're going to go. They're not going to take that step in faith. They're not going to trust God the way you're going to trust God. They're not going to see miracles the way you're going to see miracles. There are some friends, there are some family that you've just got to leave at the foot of the mountain and keep going to what God has called you to go to. I want you to see Abraham's faith. He said, we're going to go. And we are gonna come back. Verse six. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them walked on together. The wood on Isaac's shoulders would 2,000 years later be replaced by the wood on Jesus' shoulders. 
as he traversed the Via Della Rosa up to a hill called Golgotha that is just 300 yards from Mount Moriah. Verse 7, Isaac turned to his father Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son. We have the fire and we have the wood, the boy said. But where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Oh, can I speak to the dads just for a second? I hope you worship God in spirit and truth in front of your kids so much that they can tell when something is missing from worship. I hope they, they can look from the outside from a distance and say, you know, there's something not right with that worship. He looked and he said, I've seen you, you worship God over and over and over again. And there's always a sacrifice. Daddy, where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice today? Abraham said, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. And they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. By this time, Abraham is 120 to 116 years old. Isaac is 16 to 20. You don't think Isaac could have whooped his daddy? Huh? If you went on a camping trip with your dad and they left everybody at the foot of the mountain and then they're going up and then all of a sudden, you know the process of the sacrifice? Then all of a sudden he's like, son, put your hands behind your back. You don't think you'd have been out of there? <laughs> Isaac submitted to his father just like Jesus would submit to his father. A few hundred yards from there is a place called Gethsemane. It's an olive grove where Jesus spent his last night praying. And Jesus said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. John chapter 10, verse number 18 says, Jesus speaking, he said, no one takes my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it back up again for this is what my father has commanded verse 10 Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice stop for a moment put yourself in Abraham's sandals don't you imagine that Abraham is sobbing? Tears are flowing into his beard. As he raises the knife to obey God, I would imagine that Isaac was crying too. Daddy, please don't. I'll clean my tent, I promise. <laughs> Verse 11. At that moment, an angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven. So this was loud. All the way from heaven, this angel calls out to him and says, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, he replied, I am here. Don't lay a hand on the boy. Don't hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear the Lord God. For you have not withheld from me even your son, your only son there's that phrase again verse 13 Abraham looked up and he saw a ram caught in a thicket so he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son 
in theological terms, this is what we call substitutionary atonement. In other words, Isaac was supposed to have been sacrificed, but Jehovah Jireh provided a lamb. Just like 2,000 years later, it was my sin that I was supposed to pay for. I was supposed to pay for my sin. The wages of sin is death, but God the Father provided a substitutionary atonement for my sin and for your sin. And it was the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Jesus is our substitutionary atonement. Verse 14, Abraham named that place Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. I want you at the top of your lungs and those of you watching at home, wherever you are, I want you to shout it too. On the count of three, we're gonna, we're gonna shout, the Lord will provide. Ready? One, two, three. The Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. I want you to know that whatever God has for you, He already has the provision. You see, what Abraham didn't know is that while he was climbing up one side of the mountain, God had a lamb climbing up the other side of the mountain. But you can't see what God has coming from your side of the trial. You can't see what God has climbing up on the other side from your side of the diagnosis. You can't see what God has climbing up the other side from your side of the divorce. You can't see what God has climbing up from your side of the job loss from your side of the trial, from your side of the difficulty. It seems like God is nowhere to be found. From your side, there is no hope. From your side, there's no sense of peace. There's nothing but struggle. From your side of the mountain, it doesn't seem like God is faithful. But what you need to know is on the other side of your summit, on the other side of your obedience, on the other side of your faithfulness, on the other side of your test, God has your promise climbing on the other side. On the other side, provision is headed your way. On the other side, miracles are coming into your family. On the other side, favor is coming over your life. On the other side, Salvation for your children is coming on the other side. Deliverance is coming on the other side. God is going to trap your provision until just the right time. And if God has ever trapped your provision, you ought to take 15 seconds and give Him some praise right now. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Jehovah Jireh! Our provider. I don't know if you know it, but you and I were climbing a mountain of punishment. We were climbing a mountain of guilt. We were climbing a mountain of regret. But on the other side, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world was climbing up a mountain called Golgotha. He got caught in the thicket and they took that thicket and made it into a crown of mockery and beat it into his head. And he became our once and for all sacrifice on the other side. It's the mountain of the Lord. He's going to meet you in your grief. He's going to meet you in your job loss. He's going to meet you in your pain. You just got to keep climbing. 
Oh, I'm speaking to somebody who's thought about giving up this week. And can I tell you, if you give up, you'll never see the promises of God come true. You can't give up. You got to keep climbing. Because on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. You got to keep climbing. I know you're struggling with depression. You got to keep climbing. I know you're struggling with addiction. You got to keep climbing. The Bible says that a righteous man falls seven times and he gets back up. He's not righteous because he falls. He's righteous because he gets back up and keeps climbing. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. I thank you that you're meeting your people on the mountain of the Lord. And it will be provided. Strength, peace, favor, provision, hope. Oh, thank you, Lord. Grace. Grace. Mercy is on top of the mountain of the Lord. Because of the blood that would pour down on Golgotha, that blood covers all of our sin. Lord, if there are some today that have not yet established a relationship with you, Holy Spirit, draw them in this moment right now. Draw them in right now. Do your work in their lives. I want everyone here and everyone watching right now to repeat this prayer out loud. Say, Father, Have mercy on me. According to your unfailing love, wash away my sin. Blot out my transgression. Thank you for Jesus paying the price. May I live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, clap your hands and give the Lord some praise.
is worth the living. Yes. Just because he lives. Thank you, Jesus. Jehovah, Jehovah, always, always, always. Hey guys, Pastor Travis Hello. and Dr. Priscilla here again, Welcome and we back. want to say once more just how much we appreciate you guys joining us and being with us right here yes. at City Church Live. And what a message about uh, Abraham and Isaac, right? That's right, and that parallelism to, you know, Jesus and then God the Father, right. you know, it's just amazing. I hope that you've taken this word, <clears throat> excuse me, and that you would hide it in your hearts because, you know, we've got to walk by faith, but we also have to remember delayed obedience is disobedience. Yeah. We can never get to the promise. And of course, those promises are assured to us. God's got blessings waiting for us on the other side of our faithfulness to sure. Him. That's Man, great. it's a great word. And I'm just so glad that you guys were able to be here today. And I'm so blessed by that. And maybe you guys would like to get to know City Church a little bit yeah. today. Well, guess what? We want to get to know you too. So why don't you do this? Why don't you text the word City VIP to the number 94000. When you do that, we'll send you a link. You click it and fill out some info so that we can get to know you guys a little. And then we, in response, we'll send you some information about City Church as well so that you guys can see what's going on here and how you can get involved and all that sort of thing. So once again, that word is City VIP. And if you would text that to 94000, we would love to get to know you guys just a little bit better. Yes, and as always, we welcome you if you're if it's your first time or if you're joining yeah. back with us. You know, we are so happy to have you join us. We don't just Absolutely. say that. Absolutely. You're a City Church family extended. And we, as always, are not just here in Cordova, but all over the world. And so therefore, uh, we have opportunities whereby you can 
uh, partner with us yeah. for that. And if the Holy Spirit does, you know, prick your heart, you know, kind of speak to you about joining so in on evangelizing and carrying the word forward all over the world, here's how you can do that. We have our new app. You can go to your app store, look for City Church, and then search for Cordova. And then once you're, uh, you find it, you'll be guided to give securely there. Secondly, you can go online to our, our website. It's citychurch.live, and you can click on the giving tab. Thirdly, you can text the word city to the number 888-364-4483 and follow the instructions. Lastly, you can mail in a check made out to City Church, and our address is 8200 Macon Road here in Cordova, Tennessee, 38018. Yes, what a absolutely. Blessing. It's so good yes. to be in this place and have everybody, every one of you join joining with us online and because of people like you sewing into the ministry of City Church, I wanted to let you know that we're able to support the work of God all around the world yes. because of yes. people like you who are willing Amen. to give when God is leading you to the work of the Lord is not stopping all across the world. We're yes. able to support, I think it's over 45 missionaries right now Amen. who are doing the work of God in different contexts that I'm not placed in, that you're right. not placed in, right. and that you guys aren't in either. But because of your giving, we're able to touch those people with the gospel of yes. Christ and so that their lives can be changed. So I wanted to tell you that your giving is making a difference. And I just want to say once more, before we get out of here, that we love you guys. We appreciate yes, we you do. joining. And we look forward to seeing you next Sunday right here at City Church Live. God bless you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Water is life. Having clean drinking water is something that most of us in the United States take for granted. At the turn of a faucet, you can rinse your dishes, take a shower, and make a refreshing glass of iced tea. But imagine life without clean water, where you have to travel hours on foot in the hot sun just to find a muddy trench filled with stagnant rainwater. Insects have laid their eggs in it, your livestock drink from it. It is diseased with animal feces and urine, but it's the best you got to bring home to your children and family. Water determines quality of life. Water is essential. Water is life. And water is the vehicle which the gospel is being spread in Africa. Over the next few years, Speed the Light has made the commitment to spread the gospel through unconventional means. We are bringing physical water along with the living water of Jesus Christ to completely transform these desperate villages in Africa. Your Speed the Light money will make it possible for World Serve to strategically dig wells just like this one next to churches. These churches then become powerful oasis centers in which water provides sanitation, restores dignity, and changes lives for all eternity. Will you help? Speed the Light is calling you, along with thousands of students across America, to end the water crisis in Africa once and for all, bringing the gospel to the most remote places so that every person may find life in Jesus Christ.